All right. Hello, uh, competitive popper commander players. So what you're going to be experiencing today is something that has never happened before. And as promised, uh, we got our man, Jonathan hanging out with us. Hello. Yeah. So what has not happened before is we have never analyzed, compared, what have you, uh, data from uh, tournaments uh, occurring in the same year, uh, or tournaments ever. So what this does is give us the opportunity to do a little deep dive while doing a, a long view with, yeah, we get to talk about some stuff, junk, and things. It's always my favorite. And of course, uh, our man Jonathan's going to be here. Uh, I don't know. He's he's known for his spicy takes, right? Right? Is that what you're known for? Uh, you might see some spicy takes today. We'll we'll see. Sweet. Sweet. I love the spice. Uh some would say we don't get spicy enough on this channel. We can change that today if you like. So uh let's see. Covering our bases here. Uh at the time of this recording, this is one week post RIW tournament. Uh, I have released an article which hasn't been published yet as of this recording. Uh, I've give that, I gave that to Brian this morning, uh, specifically looking at the data for the tournament there, but no comparison data to anything else. Um, a bunch of people have put out a lot of information on, uh, the tournament, their impressions, all of that stuff. None will have what we're going to reveal to you today. Zero. Only we do that. So... A little bit of a timing thing. Uh, on the horizon, which may be important or relevant, depending on when you're watching this or listening to this, uh, in at the end of August, we're going to have another uh, Riches to Rags tournament hosted in Philly. Uh, I think before that, uh, when is uh, when is Sanctuary's uh, next tournament? July? So Sanctuary's ne next tournament is in August, but they're doing a league in July. Okay, so league play at Sanctuary in July, August, probably early, mid-August uh, for Sanctuary. So there's an online tournament at the beginning of August. There's a in-person tournament at the end of August. And Magic MagicCon 30 is not really a tournament, but there's going to be a whole lot of, uh, yeah, thanks to yours truly and others that are showing, uh, a whole lot of uh, PDH play there. But then, uh, word on the street is... And I really can't confirm anything at this moment, but just a word on the street is that someone is trying to put together a Popper Commander 2K uh, around October, November. Uh, it hasn't been completely finalized. It's kind of halfway there, that sort of thing. So if that happens, I mean, talk about a year for Popper Commander, right? So uh, basically what we're doing today is just kind of a lead up to what's coming, uh, help you guys prepare, kind of help us understand what the hell's, what the hell's going on and how these rogue decks just keep showing up and taking things down. I digress. So, all right. Mm -hmm. It's good to see this format taking some traction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Big year. Big year for Popper Commander. So I think, uh, you got anything else you want to share before I transition screens and we get into the, the document? No, let's just get into the data. Sweet. So, as per usual, our uh, data wizard, Bodarn, does his little statistical magic and he outkicks or out, uh, out, outputs a, uh, a report. Both John and, uh, Jonathan and I have had the opportunity to kind of read over it. Like I said, I uh, referenced some of this information for an article that I put out today. Uh, well, to be determined when it's coming out, but I wrote it today. Um, yeah, so... When essentially what you see before you is a synopsis of three previous tournaments, uh, Riches to Rags, which was in April. Was that April? I think so. April. Either I'm one. not sure. Yeah. So let's say April uh, Sanctuary Open Series, which was in May, and then RIW, which was just this last weekend, uh, June 24th. So... Uh, what we have here is he's got his typical breakdown of uh, how he explains uh, um, 
what the different terminologies are. Once again, it's statistical, not predictive, you know, make your own conclusions, yada, yada, yada. Um, and for this one in particular, for the first time, he talks about what open play data is and what tournament data is and how he worked through uh, those those items. And then once again, defines what winningness is and um, uh, what meta and fringe terminology is. And that's that's really important because we don't want to use fringe to, you know, denigrate or otherwise. But, you know, fringe is fringe is good because it means it's almost there. Right. So to that end, I guess I can just scroll down to the riches to rags. Which is up here on screen now. So they had 30 games for riches to rags earlier this year uh, of that. Of that tournament, uh, it was Gretchen, Bobby playing Gretchen, right? Yeah. Yep. He, he took down the tournament with Gretchen. Yep. Bobby playing Gretchen. Uh, and of course, I didn't know until today that there was a, a Viscopa uh, uh, player at that tournament as well. So, um, of the yeah, with meta. Four wins. Yeah. Which means Viscopa was always doing well. Yes. It didn't yeah. just pop up in this latest tournament. Absolutely. Now, I would imagine that, uh, um, now this is me speaking well out of turn and I can't confirm, but I would imagine that that version of Viscopa is probably more the spell based uh, version that we've probably historically seen where they're uh, trying. Now, you would know this because you played uh, a lot of Viscopa. Uh, basically, you're trying to just uh, get a big life gain spell and then copy that as many times as you can. Yeah. yeah, yeah, pretty pretty much. I know the. I know I'm talking a bit out of line here, but in the latest in the latest um, RIW that mm -hmm. Viscopa won, that mm -hmm. deck is just full of life gain spells, life gain creatures, life link creatures, mm -hmm. and so like the chance of you drawing them is about 100% in that deck. <laughs> but in more traditional Viscopa lists, you don't run that many and you run more interaction so that you can fight for the combo. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's interesting to see the takes on Viscopa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having uh, having lost horribly to the modern version of that, uh, he crafted it to where it was almost, uh, almost solely triggers. So there's only one way in competitive popper commander to deal with a trigger and zero people in the tournament were playing the crap. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, uh, that's, that's, uh, uh, Paul is a very smart individual and, uh, he did his homework to say the least. So anyway, uh, back to yeah. uh, riches to rags. Now, once again, uh, the difference between meta and fringe here is just a, uh, a statistical difference. So you basically have an in-group and an out-group. Uh, what Bodarn is suggesting is that uh, e any of these seven under the same conditions would still have uh, a moderately good chance. Obviously, uh, Bobby piloting Gretchen, you know, that's a that's a almost 20 percent difference in win percentage. Um, we've been doing some behind the scenes speculating for a while now, talking about, uh, uh, how pod composition and actually, uh, pilot skill is contributing to these things. And the first thing I think of when I see that big of a deviation from one win percentage to the next is there has to be some sort of pilot comfort, pilot skill, uh, contributing to that. Not all of it, but you know, there's probably something there. So, uh, definitely. And the decks that seem the most scary to play that no one wants to pick up always perform better because there's always one person mm -hmm. who just does really well with that deck. And they're like, yeah, I'm just going to keep playing this deck. Like, what's the point of switching? Mm hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, an intimate knowledge of, uh, I mean, I, I think I can uh, point to a few people. Of course, uh, uh, Puzzle Box is uh, he, his, his, uh, I don't think he's taken anything but Gretchen to an event. Uh, in the last like six months, whether that be a league or tournament or, you know, what have you. So just, yeah, a comfort with, with the list definitely adds a significant amount of weight to your opportunities to, to pull out some wins. So, uh, 
think that's pretty much straightforward. Uh, Riches to Rags has been covered in depth in other materials put out by other folks. Basically, we're just using um, uh, Riches to Rags and then the Sanctuary Open um, tournaments as, uh, as pivot points to basically talk about uh, more specifically RIW. So uh, I'm good with what we see here. I mean, there's some, there's some archetype information in here that, uh, uh, we can kind of look up. In fact, I'll probably just bring up, uh, uh, this stuff in a different screen. So that way, uh, there we go. So that way I can, uh, look at it and compare. Uh, do you have any commentary on, uh, Rags to Riches archetypes or colors? Uh, look, these are all decks that C play a lot. Like these are all well-known decks. Nothing surprising here. Combo doing quite well, but mm -hmm. in a tournament setting where time limit is a factor, that's not that much of a surprise. Mm -hmm. So just to point out that, uh, yeah, combo and then uh, blue in this instance uh, has a 5.1% uh, winningness. I always say that incorrectly. Winningness. Uh, winningness. Yeah. It just means 5% is not that big. Mm-mm. -mm. But its popularity is a bit more than the rest of the colors. So blue was seen, seen quite a bit. So there's an opportunity. Uh, there's an opportunity to have a higher winningness score because it's o not overrepresented, but because of the level of representation may lend more towards, you know, more opportunity. Anyhow, <laughs> so that's uh, that's uh, riches to rags. Uh, once again, we'll probably touch on some of these points. Just kind of rolling through to get the basics before we get to the meat right so next we have um a sanctuary series uh now this is a smaller tournament only had 12 games and was 16 was it 16 people yeah 16 players and there's only two decks listed here yeah so this would mean that uh the meta decks were oh this is actually the first time that I'm seeing this because I uh, glossed over this earlier. So Malcolm Dargo would have been a meta deck. Oh, am I blushing? I'm blushing. I'm blushing. So <laughs> Malcolm Dargo would have been considered a meta deck. And I suppose uh, what this really meant, because uh, Bodarn's usually really thorough, is that uh, there were no... Uh, oh, no, no, no. I, I rem reading that incorrectly. So there is one meta deck, one fringe deck. And the rest of them, uh, I assume, because of the meta cutoffs, uh, didn't make the cut for either one of those. A am I saying that correct? Yeah, so some of the other decks that got one win won't be seen here. Mm -hmm. So we got Abdel with a 100% win rate, four wins, <laughs> and he's considered that meta. Mm -hmm. He said his meta cutoff is three wins, but because it's such a small tournament, we can call your deck meta. Sure, why not? Hey, we did it. <laughs> oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> I don't deserve it, but it makes me happy. Sweet. I did something once in my life. All right. <laughs> um, so archetypes, no surprise. Um, combo is represented at 25%. And if we compare that to... So that's down 2% roughly from... Uh, the other representation in rags to riches to rags, uh, the, yeah, pretty much the same. Yeah, pretty much the same though. Uh, we're missing a, uh, control. There was no control decks, uh, represented. Yeah, no, in no one was playing black in this tournament. Yep. And then look at that white. So the last, uh, most winningness or color with the highest winningness, it was blue uh, white in the ra Riches to Rags tournament was uh, fourth, ranked fourth. Here, white is <clears throat> ranked first in winningness. No surprise, Abdel. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, Abdel. Yep. Uh, followed uh, directly by blue. Of course, look at that uh, popularity curve between uh, blue and white. You know, it's almost half. So, yeah. That was a that was an interesting snapshot of a, a PDH uh, sanctuary PDH uh, re report. Anything further? No. Uh, not really. Just that 
is is it decks we're seeing the most here at uh, Sanctuary? Mm-hmm. Lots of Malcolm, lots of TPI. Mm-hmm. Your Dargo list, of course. Mm-hmm. Absolute uh, fun little tournament to play in. I can't wait for the next one. I got uh, I got some spice that I'm brewing. All right. Oh. Now, uh, now to the uh, to the meat. So I know it says R I W. It's R R I R R I Y. It's supposed to be R I W. We just there we go. So, uh, spelling mistakes. <laughs> mm-hmm. So at R I W, there was forty nine games, which is not uh, not a small amount. It's not a huge amount, but it's not a small amount either. Uh, the commanders. Now, if you've been following the tournament coverage, uh, there's no surprise that, uh, well, the, the top four split, but going into that game, um, uh, Paul and Viscopa Guildmage, uh, had a commanding advantage going into that last game. So it's probably good that they split because you never know exactly the politics of that last pod and whether or not if you're doing so well people will con- collude to kind of knock you out you know just so they can uh start working to towards uh, these 1v1s type scenarios and that sort of thing so uh i mean it's better to have uh was it 2 250 than 50 all right so yeah okay so let's let's spend some time so uh, I, I wish we could have uh, flown you all the way from Australia into uh, Detroit so you could have participated in this. This was uh, probably the most interesting time I've had playing Magic in a very long time since I used to uh, grind Standard and grind Modern uh, a while ago now. Getting in and just spending all day not eating, you know, barely drinking, uh, game after game after game after game. Uh, I kind of miss that uh, that grinder lifestyle. So sounds like the best time. <clears throat> absolutely, it was. So trying to remember correctly, uh, how many? Now let me bring up my other uh, my other report here. Boop, boop, boom. So there were. So there is one pilot for Viscopa. For Sprite Dragon, there were two separate pilots, and I found out today, uh, listening to the PDH Pod podcast, that Liam had had conversations with both of those Sprite Dragon uh, players. They were actually anticipating a one v one tournament versus a four player free for all. Uh, that makes a lot of sense because Sprite Dragon is a one v one commander. Mm-hmm. So that kind of adds a new a new little wrench to the cog right of uh me being on me being on the receiving end of one of these sprite dragons it kind of uh made a whole lot of sense they they probably i'm speculating here but they probably sat down to the pod looked at the commanders looked at the players found the one that they deemed the most threatening and you know how it is voltron take them out and then try to piece the rest of the table the best way they can so yeah which can be quite difficult if you've just taken a player out mm-hmm. uh for gut true zealot there were three separate pilots uh for Aranus, uh street urchin there were two and gretchen had three pilots so of the of the meta decks uh viscopa was the only one that had a singular pilot so that 80% win rate was contributed by one person. Uh, the rest of those are just, you know, an aggregate. So, uh, I don't see uh, Malcolm Dargo in there anywhere. Nope. Okay. <laughs> Were you playing Malcolm Dargo this tournament? Uh, I was. Uh, uh, I, had to, I had some bad matchups, to say the least. Uh, Stax was my very first out of the gate. I know, I know Stax. I know. For those of you out there in the in the world that uh, you know just heard me say a four letter word, I'm I'm so sorry. Uh, so yeah, that was my first one, and his intention was to basically draw the game out. So it doesn't bode well when you're trying to uh, accumulate wins. So sometimes you get got, yeah. and it is what it is. So. Um, 
of these top decks, uh, do you see anything that uh, stands out? Anything that's unexpected? <clears throat> well, there's quite a bit unexpected. Viscopa winning mm -hmm. is quite unexpected, especially with an 80% win rate. That's not something you see uh, every day. Now, Viscopa has been predicted to uh, be a good tournament commander. It's mm -hmm. got all the anti anti uh, combo pieces. So it can survive well and also has game winning lines. Mm -hmm. uh, we did not see any stacks pieces from Viscopa and we didn't see any interaction. We just saw the game winning lines. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, and uh, it's that curious. was an interesting take on Viscopa. <clears throat> and it's actually curious because the. Uh... The removal and interaction that he had was um, not what you would consider to be the most uh, optimal or efficient or whatever buzzwords we want to use. Like he was <clears throat> like bacon to a pie is probably the best example that I can provide because it uh, destroys a creature and creates a food talk, a food token, which gives a uh, opportunity for a life gain trigger. So everything about the deck was about leveraging some life gain component some hey, somehow some way so um maybe there's a you know if it's not broke don't fix it i know but you know maybe there's an opportunity to uh probably focus the deck more on certain certain opportunities certain spells certain avenues uh certain lines and then uh, add in some uh, more cost efficient because I mean bacon to a pie is four four mana. You know I don't even know. Yeah, if it's... and that's his like only kill spell in there. I think so. Yeah, it was just, <laughs> it was basically <laughs> what was it get to uh, get to eleven and pray? Is that is that basically the 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 mantra was eleven mana and pray? So that... wondering how this deck won. Um, I heard from the pilot of the deck that mm. um, they dodged a lot of problem matchups, mm. which is kind of the opposite of you. You got all your problem matchups. Mm. He mm. dodged a lot of them. Mm. And in the games where Fiscopa got to stick on the board, are games that Fiscopa would probably win. Mm -hmm. And that's true with a lot of commanders, mm -hmm. but he got into matchups where no one was running removal. Mm -hmm. So I had. Uh, the, uh, the, the fourth match, the, I was part of the feature matches. I was the fourth round feature match. And, um, I don't recall exactly what was happening at the time. Uh, I actually had to watch the footage to kind of see when Viscopa entered the battlefield. I think there was a lot of table talk happening at the time. And, uh, the, the, the deploying on my end, anyway, the deploying of, of Viscopa was kind of lost in the sauce, but to that end, like I had, uh, three pieces of interaction in hand and uh, a Tormod's Crypt, which, I mean, doesn't affect Viscopa, but, you know, another piece on board for you know, looking for any line that's going to be, you know, happening. And by the time he, he started cracking and holding priority and cracking and holding priority, there was like nothing we could do, like nothing. And yeah, once you untap with mana and you have Viscopa on board, like counter spells are just not not mm -hmm. useless. Removal, do anything. yeah, removal doesn't do anything. Uh, the only way that you can affect it is uh, the crab, and even then, uh, we would have just denied him a trigger, so he would have drained most of our life. Well, he would have killed Bobby, so leaving Ryan and I alive, which would have been probably enough for uh, Ryan to go in and crack him, kill him, and then me crack Ryan. So, had I run the crab? <laughs> oh, not just the crab. Had you removed Fiscopa before his upkeep? Correct, is... and I had a I had a Echoing Truth in hand. So, for what it's worth, uh, Fiscopa not seen much play, even in online. Mm -hmm. Fiscopa does see a little bit of play online, mm -hmm. but it's mainly by a lot of different new players trying out Fiscopa once and then never touching Fiscopa again. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of different Viscopa deck lists out there. There are. So no one knows what Viscopa like mm -hmm. actually does and like what the best it can perform. Mm -hmm. I guess and we found so, out uh, how the, how do they say yeah. how, what do the kids say? Uh, 
Uh, we messed around and found out. <laughs> now you know. Yeah. And now, now, from this tournament result, maybe in the future this scope will be seen, but it might struggle a bit now that people know what it does. Mm -hmm. And I think there's an opportunity there too. Like uh, um, uh, Paul is, would readily admit that uh, uh, the way he built the deck is not necessarily optimized. He just basically was leaning into uh, the synergy, the life gain synergy. So there's, there's an opportunity for someone to come in and I'm more, a more competitively minded player. Uh, definitely not a more brilliant player because uh, Paul is exactly that. Um, you know, but there's opportunity there's for someone so to come, come in and do something along the same lines, but to kind of cut from here and add to there and, you know, that sort of thing. So needless to say, yeah, so many different ways you mm -hmm. can build this Copa. You can build it mid range, like ported, you can go combo or you can even go full on control. Yeah. Sweet. Um, the Sprite dragons, you said earlier that, uh, uh, see, I don't play any, uh, PDC, any one V one. So I don't know what the, uh, uh, the, the contenders are over there. I, I, I know that, uh, it's my favorite story to tell because <clears throat> it's absolutely true the way that I tell it. Uh, uh, the fi fifth and final pod, uh, I face off against this, uh, the, the, the younger gentleman, uh, uh, who was piloting the Sprite dra Dragon, uh, deck. It's the one that, uh, had Ryan sign, uh, his card with this, flourishy goldy you know pop a popper that sort of thing so this kid sits down and one of the four people don't show it's the last pod you know so uh they're like hey just play it out and i was tired i didn't think anything of it so i i drew what i thought would be a moderately quick hand and he picked me i mean little kid picked me so i was playing against him and the mother of runes deck and uh, I'm sitting here deploying my things and he's beefing up this uh, sprite dragon uh, and he's just bashing me in the face with it. And it says every time he turns it sideways, I get a real good view of that pop a popper ridden all the way across it. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm like, you son of a bitch. So <clears throat> I'm looking at the uh, mother of runes player. I'm like, brah, you know, a little help. <laughs> he's like, what do you want me to do? And I, uh, yeah. uh, like, well, like, it was a free player game. So yeah. This there's not much you can do in that scenario. And that was the smartest thing for him to do is, uh, you know, I've got the most possibility, uh, or opportunity for interaction in that game. Uh, so take me out and then focus on, uh, mother runes who needed some more time to set up. Uh, I mean, it was a brilliant strategy and he, he did what he had to do, but it's just, I think it was like three turns of getting hit in the face with, uh, you know, Sprite drag, Papa Poppers, Sprite Dragon. So I'll probably remember that one for a while. So if the other build was built similarly, I didn't have time. I typed in uh, every single one of these 44 deck lists because they were given to me. In fact, here you go. They're sitting right here. They were given to me in this stack of paper here. So I took all of these deck lists that were either typed out or handwritten or all that stuff and I entered every one into uh, Moxfield so that way I could share them back with the uh, RAW folks so that way they could have access to them in perpetuity uh, but also give us the opportunity to have give everybody everybody the opportunity for access so I haven't, I haven't had the time to kind of look between the various lists like the two sprite dragons the three guts the the two or er, is the three gretchens i haven't had the opportunity to do any comparative stuff i'm sure in fact i'm damn near positive that uh those who are interested in gut inspiring leader have already looked through those lists to kind of see what those folks were doing and what they weren't doing well what they weren't doing and all of that stuff same thing with gretchen uh i'm quite sure some person who's always i don't know who but some person who's like hmm i've been looking at aaron as street urchin for a while um now i have some source material and you know i'm i'm sure all five uh of these commanders in their you know nine ten eleven deck lists that are representing them 
Uh, I'm sure all of them have been reviewed thoroughly since Tuesday, since I got those posted on Tuesday. So, anything... Uh, yeah, speaking about Aaron, a street urchin, that's a deck that we haven't seen yet. No. Or talked about. Well, I've... I've heard some talk because Aranus gives that uh, death touch and basically uh, it's a it's a mayhem devil esque. It's not quite mayhem devil, but it's it's kind of like that. And the fact that you can do board control uh, with it. So, I mean, I've heard about it uh, talked about previously, uh, but just talk. I, I haven't I haven't seen it deployed anywhere. And I'd be curious to see, you know, in events forthcoming, uh, what that will do, you know, to the meta. Yeah, so it's a it's a heavy control deck, and it's it's quite good at controlling the board. It mm -hmm. just takes some turns to set up. Mm -hmm. So if the aggro player looks at you funny, mm -hmm. it's over. Mm -hmm. But if there's no aggro on the table, or they the aggro player decides to go for someone else, and you set up your your board, you can really control mm -hmm. down the board state, and eventually eventually win. As more more often than not, games do go to draw when when you're playing heavy control like that. But it seems like in this tournament, Aaron has managed to grab three wins. Yeah, pretty good. Yeah, I'm taking a look real quick. So, oh, it'd be on this one here. So Gretchen, let's see. So Riches to Rags had five wins and an 83.3% uh, win percentage. Uh, Gretchen in, um, ooh, passed right over it. Uh, was, oh, that's right. Wasn't even listed in, oh, because nobody, did somebody play? Yeah, puzzle. In Century, everyone played, everyone played four. Gretchen. There were yeah, three, it was four. There there was four like, different yeah. Gretchens. Yeah, so even, okay, so uh, the statistics that we showed earlier, there was two decks. There was uh, the, the meta deck in Abdel and the, then the fringe deck in Malcolm Dargo. So Gretchen didn't even show up in either one of those lists. Not to say that that's a bad thing, but what we're doing is we're suggesting that rags to riches, high win percentage, becomes a known quality, especially after, because uh, uh, Rags to Riches was directly after CBB 100. So Puzzle, Bobby, bringing notoriety to the deck, gets played in Sanctuary, four decks in Sanctuary. Uh, doesn't have as big a showing there. And then <clears throat> see it find, uh, find, you see it trying to find footing in the RIW tournament, and it has some performance you know, it's it's performing better than the uh, uh, the uh, what is it the stati statistical average of you know the expected twenty five percent you know whatever, uh, which is kind of a uh, a misnomer now that I think about it because by the time you have the first match, I digress. Um, so kind of curious what the future of Gretchen is. You know, we were on a we were on a high point. We had a little bit of a low point. Is this uh, Gretchen, you know, coming back? Is this, uh, is it still, are we on the way down? Like, you know, what the trend line looks like for Gretchen moving forward. Uh, I'm reasonably sure Puzzle will stick with it for a while because <clears throat> he loves that deck to death. So, I don't know. He could surprise me too. So, what are your thoughts on uh, on Gretchen? I, I would not yeah. call it a low point in Sanctuary because it did reach the finals. And I think the Rich is maybe scared a lot of players into killing Gretchen first or mm. interacting with Gretchen a lot more. But Gretchen did uh, did reach the finals along along with uh, your Dargo Malcolm and TPI, I believe. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Abdel was on that table, mm. so not much you could do. The way that all works 100% out. 100% win rate. Yeah, the rest is history. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> So I'm trying to remember. Yeah, I think Gretchen is in a good position right now in the meta. It's performing well. It's a well-known deck, and it's a deck that you do have to to know how it works, what it does, just in case it's on the same table as you. Absolutely. Well, very well put. Absolutely. In fact, well, uh, the reason why I ask this is uh, uh, in the uh, TLDR at the bottom, we kind of talk about uh, uh, 
a certain number of lists that are, uh, it's the aggregate over the year and all that stuff. And, uh, Gretchen is on that list. So I wanted to kind of, uh, foreshadow a little bit cause I'm sneaky. <clears throat> So, uh, we can talk more in depth about, uh, archetype information, uh, for, I assume it, oh, we didn't cover the fringe. Um, so having played against, uh, Disciple Deceit, Floodgate, uh, I didn't play against Malcolm Kettis, Conrad, or Risen Reef, or Rilsa Rail, but Rilsa Rail is kind of a known entity, Malcolm Kettis is kind of a known entity, and I've played Conrad myself, but not, not this build, but I'm familiar enough. Um, it's, it's not the only thing surprising to me here is the fact that, uh, uh, of the fri the, the statistically fringe decks, uh, Malcolm Kettis, uh, was the worst performer of the bunch and just, you know, on the edge, that's kind of like the, the thing that's most surprising to me looking at this list here, but like, uh, uh, Dallas, who was doing the, uh, so Dallas from Riches to Rags was piloting Disciple of Deceit, and, and they are a tremendous pilot of that deck. They know that list backwards, forwards, and you can tell because <clears throat> there's a lot of searching, and they're like, uh, you know, okay, discard this, search this, you know, okay, I need XYZ to complete this chain, yada, 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 okay, here's present a win, you know. So they they know that deck back and backwards and forwards and it it definitely showed. So I thought. Uh, so what do you think about Floodgate? I I think it's a it's a decent control deck and it's mono blue, so it's got your combo finish. Mm -hmm. It is a little slow mm -hmm. in my in my opinion, but once you get get it going, if you make your land drops every turn. Mm -hmm. and you're able to flicker a floodgate uh you can seriously stop some plays mm -hmm. unfortunately it doesn't hit malcolm which mm -hmm. is one of the weaknesses of that deck yeah i didn't really get to see so the most impressive thing that i saw from it which was the only thing that i saw from it uh because he bobby was basically just land go land because i mean the 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 board was full of i mean Myself and Ryan, who was playing uh, Rissa Rail. I did play against Rissa Rail. Duh. Uh, myself and Ryan had a bunch of like blue creatures, so um, or big, big toughness creatures. So uh, Bobby was just in a land go kind of mode, and then when Paul presented a win, uh, Bobby was trying to uh, combo on top of that. Uh, he didn't get there, but uh, you know, just the whole. Uh, I'm always. Um, um, it, thoroughly impressed by uh, people trying to win on top of other people's wins, which is uh, kind of a rare thing in in our format. So I'm hopeful that that'll start happening more often. But yeah, uh, that's the only thing that I saw Floodgate do all day was that. And that's it. Otherwise, it was land go, land go, land go. So it's hard for me to really have an assessment of the list when that's all I really saw. So... Yeah, well, I've seen it. I've seen it uh, played in the Sanctuary tournament, uh, not mm -hmm. tournament, in the Sanctuary server. Mm -hmm. We've had a few friendly games with Bobby. He tried out the deck a few times. It it is it is a little slow. Um, similar to Erin's Street Urchin, it's mm. like once you get the engine going, you can control the board. But then, is it too late? Is has time already ran out? Let's mm. see. That's the oh, issue. And that's one thing that we didn't talk about uh, yet. Um, uh, I found it extremely uh, stressful when I found out uh, the in the week prior to the tournament that the rounds were going to be 80 minutes. So our typical, uh, as you know, uh, our typical round time is 90, 95, depending on who's hosting it, right? So to cut that back to 80 minutes, like uh, that, that was inducing a whole lot of stress. So for folks who were thinking about the meta, whether or not the meta, thinking about the tournament, the circumstances of the, of the tournament, uh, I'm, I'm curious if anyone changed their selection based on the, the revelation that the rounds were going to be 80 minutes or like, you know, folks like Bobby or the, the people playing Aranus, uh, did they, did they know, did they care? Do they, you know, I'm, I'm curious of how like round time is affecting. Cause we don't know that. I mean, it's so new, 
we don't know um, what that effect is yet on on people selecting. So there was a lot of draws in the tournament, seven. like a lot of games went to time. Yeah, seven. Yeah, but also, in most of those games, the players purposely went to time. Like some <laughs> players were stalling a bit. Some players <laughs> wanted to go to time because they still get a few points. Yep. If if it draws. Mm-hmm. So they're like, all right, I can't win, but I'm just not going to let anyone else win. Mm-hmm. So there is there is a certain meta with that, and uh, I know people do hate that mm-hmm. when they're the, they're the player with the winning line, but someone's just there to draw out the game. So like, I mean, play faster. Come on. <laughs> yeah. So you you bring up an interesting thing that we just don't simply have an interesting point. We simply don't have any answers to because you know there you're correct. There were people that. From the onset, we're intentionally trying to draw, you know, for Xen Sensor. You know, that was the game plan was to get in and draw every because you get one point for every draw and you get zero points for losing. So, <laughs> so why not? Why not uh, draw out every game? So, and then uh, rely on some sort of tie breaking method or uh, other uh, matchups, right? So, yeah. Uh, do you have anything? Uh, oh, so this uh, this Risen Reef uh, deck now Risen Reef is uh, Simic, correct? If I r- recall that, yeah. Um, there was there was nothing. Well, I was going to say there was nothing special, but I mean it was elementals. <laughs> but I mean to that end, like there was no there was no like weird tech or you know some shapeshifter thing or I mean there were shapeshifters in the deck or change things in the deck, but there was no. There was no like tech based on all of that. It was, it was basically a, an elemental aggro deck, and yeah. Well, spicy take. Risen Reef is a casual deck. Mm. It's not not a tournament deck. Uh, how it got <laughs> two wins. I was talking with some of the players who faced Risen Reef. Mm-hmm. How it got those wins was mainly the other players exhausted all their resources on each other, and the Risen Reef just came and finished them off with a bunch of creatures. There you go. So, so and it, it is very typical of what we see a lot in online play as well. One yeah. player brings a a not a not uh like a not really a tournament style deck, more of a like a mid rangey type of deck that just sits under the radar mm-hmm. and just comes in and swoops swoops in for the win. Mm-hmm. Now there is some yeah. there is some strategy to that. Um, I mean, you know, taking a win and you know, under the allotted amount of time, you know, whether or not you're, um, uh, to use an American boxing term, like, uh, rope doping some, you know, your, the rest of your opponents, and then just kind of like cleaning up the, uh, the mess. I mean, there's one could argue that there's some strategy to that. So yeah. Yeah. that just means that the pilot of the deck was a really good player. Mm. They're just using a slightly weaker deck, but still mm. a good pilot. Mm. So that's fair. So, yeah, needless to say, we're we're all of these uh, individual um, um, uh, contributing factors. You know, whether or not somebody's playing a slightly uh, a, an excellent pilot, playing a slightly underpowered deck, just hanging out, you know, picking up scraps, you know, or whether or not uh, you know my man Jonathan's coming in with the uh, you know the razor blade and like cutting as fast as they can, you know, like there's, there's different strategies coming into these tournaments and we just haven't, we have, we have an awareness. We just don't know how, what the causal, you know, relationship is between, uh, pot composition, player skill, all of that stuff yet. We're just kind of talking out of our ass as it were, uh, trying to throw things against the wall to ideas against the wall, see if they stick. I think we're doing a good job compared to, uh, where were we at, where we were at the beginning of this year. I think we have a, uh, an increasingly better understanding of where the meta is headed, you know, what the tournament scene looks like, you know, comparatively. So instead of hypotheticals, we actually have some stuff. So, uh, anything further on these last lists? Uh, so you said that the Sircon Red list was a little different to the one you played. So what was the difference? So I uh, I played uh, Conrad Rats. So it had thirty rat colonies in it, and was basically a uh, aggro first plan that basically pushed a bunch of uh, aggro and then capitalized off of a full graveyard with Conrad. 
So it was a, a Conrad finish, rather. Um, the majority of Conrad de uh, decks that are played uh, are, are a grindy value type Conrad. So um, I've been seeing a lot more lately that are actually uh, turbo ramping Conrad out. So that way they can deploy creatures behind them and get that immediate value. Uh, that's more of a recent development. Historically, it was uh, try to establish some sort of threat. So that way, by the time you deploy Conrad, uh, um, it's it's not the primary target. Because, I mean, five mana, right? So, so would you say they were playing more of like a burn version of the deck or like a combo version? I have to, you know, you got me. I want to say, if I recall, now I've looked at a couple lists since then. I want to say that it was a uh, just a, a grindy mid-range list. But I'll be able to tell you in two shakes of a lamb's tail. Uh, sir, 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 sir. Boom. There it is. Okay, so... Okay, 32 creatures. Oh, so it's a... Uh, So it had some burn, some burn components in it. So uh, the the same types of things we're seeing in the subordinate deck, not completely because there's a um, um, uh, mass discard. And okay, so it's a mix of everything, really. So more mid range, like you were saying, mid range, yep. Yeah. So with some bigger creatures to kind of finish things out, yeah. So. Of course, they're playing. Ooh, thirty-two lands. Ooh, man, <laughs> man, <laughs> uh, not on my best day. Well, I suppose if you're playing all the I mean, mana rocks and mana dorks. I've been playing. I've been playing twenty-five to twenty-eight lands on my lists. So. Mm -hmm. well, you're also you're also uh, playing uh, uh, Roger and Malcolm and. You know, the, the, there's trade-offs. I, uh, I've i started kind of ticking down. I think I'm hovering around 32, 33 based on what I'm, I'm doing these days. So uh, with this next list, uh, that might actually start ticking down because it's a, a two mana. This next list that I'm going to start playing uh, moving forward uh, as a two mana commander. So I have, a, I have some opportunity to slim it up a little bit. So Okay. So, all right. Yeah. Uh, shall we move on to the to the uh, archetypes? The comparison data. Yeah, yeah. Archetypes first. Yep. Uh, just kind of briefly, like touching. Um, so, it's listed in alphabetic order according to uh, archetype, uh, but combo naturally is the. Uh, uh, actually, it's listed by winningness. It just so happens to be also alphabetical by archetype. Uh, so combo is the most popular, always, it just seems to be that way, uh, but it's the second, it has the second winningness uh, rate out of all. Uh, aggro, of course, having some some performance. I, I, I don't think in previous uh, tournaments, look at this real quick, no, aggro, aggro and sanctuary, it was underperforming. Uh, Aggro in yeah, so this is the first time that aggro had a positive winningness score, which is something to say, I guess, right? Yep. Well, all these all these winningness rates are quite close to zero compared to the twenty five twenty six percent that we had last time. Also a good point. But yeah. Also a good but point. Good, good, good on aggro. Good on. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> what is different? Uh, kind of pairing into colors what is different than previous tournaments is that black had a showing and not only That's did it this paper. yeah not only did it have a showing but once again like uh pointing out to what jonathan said and i even said this in my article uh the delta between uh the the winningest most winningest or winningness the highest winningness score and the lowest uh is 6.1 so there's not a there's not a deep spread between what was not you know winning and what was winning so um we can we can sit there and point 
you know, to this 3.4%. I'm just glad Black had a showing. That's, I'm just, I'm just happy for that. Yeah. Well, the Sanctuary was a very small tournament. People, no one was a Viscopa player mm -hmm. in that tournament. So mm -hmm. hopefully we'll see some more Viscopas next, next Sanctuary. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Um, so we can move over to uh, Bodoran's conclusion, if you like. Yep. So he combined all the tournaments and all the data together. Yep. Um, the turn. So he, he mentions in here some turn data, and we have to be kind of forthcoming. Uh, I don't think we got turn data for riches to rags, and I also don't think that we got turn. Well, I know that we didn't get turns data for RIW. And uh, that's something that uh, uh, Jonathan and I had talked about before I hit record is that uh, kind of moving forward, the way the turns data versus tournament data is going to be situated is hopefully knock on some wood that uh, these tournaments are so large that it's going to be just impossible to get that granular detail for each of the rounds because there's just going to be too many things happening and you won't be able to collect it. So to that end, these these um, uh, these user submitted match results uh, will serve as uh, kind of like a baseline in theory of what's possible. Uh, I think Jonathan, you're you're the one that has both. There's two turn four wins, right? You have both. Yeah, currently on the spreadsheet. Yeah, yeah, two turn four wins. I got one with Dargo Casket, one with Malcolm Progress. Okay, I did so, hear that someone in the RIW Disciple of the Seat did get a turn four win as well. Yeah. So happy to share that with them. <laughs> Fastest wins in the format. <laughs> and I, I don't think that's actually uh, put in the uh, put in the data, but it's the if we did add it, it would be the match up against uh, um, uh, Good Good Fortune Unicorn. So whatever round that was, because it was Brian and Demars who uh, reported that turn four win. So and not and not Dallas. So um what was I gonna say? Damn it. Oh, so the turns the what's important to note about the turns is that um uh, as people submit, as people are practicing in uh uh, uh submitting these games, um it gives people uh, what, what we perceive to be a pretty accurate idea of uh, what's going to happen in the tournament. And uh, surprise, surprise, as we'll reveal later, that's that's probably true. So uh, just wanted to point out that uh, the turns data stuff is not necessarily uh, uh, complete. And so we can't provide an overall analysis for that. So. Let's see. So, archetypes. Combo doing quite well. Mid range doing not that great. But that's what's expected. It's pretty much mirroring the rest of the data was seen. Mm -hmm. We've got to see some mid range players winning tournaments. Come on, guys. Where's, where are those mid range decks at? <laughs> I actually uh, touched on this uh, in that uh, uh, thing, in that write up that I. Uh, uh, so, my impression, and feel free to disagree. So my impression of uh, the mid range at the moment now, number one, uh, we only have we've got more uh, combo and aggro players exploring their portion of the format uh, than there are. There's a higher total number of uh, players doing that for combo and aggro than there are for mid range. So we have just a few mid range players that are trying to figure all of this stuff out on top of. There's been a lot of uh, combo innovations in the last eight months. There's been a lot of aggro innovations in the last eight months. And mid-range is basically a reactionary force uh, to those innovations. And I think just uh, having a limited number of mid-range pilots in addition to uh, all of these changes, it's really difficult for them to get a line on uh, how they're supposed to be stacking up against the meta. So that's just... That's my impression of why mid range is not performing as well. Um, Cause it's, I mean, playing catch up basically. Yep. Well, mid range is created to stop the top meta decks of the format. Mm -hmm. The problem is when those mid range decks pair up against each other or pair up against 
maybe a deck that's not they haven't really prepared for mm -hmm. and then that deck kind of just is dead on that table mm -hmm. so that's that's the issue so i i'm holding out hope i think uh eventually the, the I think only the... mid-range deck go ahead that is performing well is uh tpi mm -hmm. and uh, there's a lot of players playing that especially in the century tournament everyone mm -hmm. was on tpi there was uh three or four three yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, very, very astute point. So, I don't know. I'm holding out hope that, because uh, this, this year has just been nothing but flux. So, I'm hopeful that uh, once everything shakes out a little bit and becomes more settled, the meta becomes more settled, uh, I'm hopeful at that point uh, we'll see uh, more assertion from the mid-range, maybe even the control folks depending on uh, uh, which builds, because we were just talking, uh, I think it was two quarters ago, you know, two quarters ago, or maybe four or five months ago, we were talking about uh, how there's really no bona fide control deck in the, in the format. Like, there's a lot of control options, but from a tournament perspective, I guess I should say, uh, there's really no uh uh good control deck so you know with Aaron as street urchin kind of coming into the into the fray uh how does that uh kind of change things up a little bit so anyway uh so we all know these commanders we've seen them already talked about them if you want to scroll down to the comparison between online play and tournament results okay is that a header Okay, so, um, okay, um, okay, according to Blue and Red, uh, year to date, uh, open play data be beyond that? Yep, open play data. Yep, this one here. Okay, cool. Yep, go ahead. So, Bodan's comparing the, the tournament data to the data that we've been collecting um, by playing online, and we've also been adding games from uh, other people's uh, local metas as well. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, in typical fashion, combo is still performing the best, only 6.1%, and everything else is near zero. So a pretty pretty well-balanced meta. And he's listed the top commanders from both tournament and from uh, open play as well. So Viscofa has a 72% win rate in tournament play, which is absolutely incredible. <laughs> but then you look at its performance in the online meta, only a 12.5% win rate. Mm -hmm. so what could be causing the difference it's, is it pilots is it people work figuring out the deck and building it up to the tournament mm -hmm. what's, what's going on so i mean i i think the uh i mean you made mention earlier that uh, uh some folks you you had observed some folks uh picking up the deck trying to figure it out and, and just kind of setting it down so i would suspect that that's probably the case you know come in get three losses and set it down you know that sort of thing i've certainly done that with a few lists of my own so <laughs> shardless agent <laughs> so uh, yeah i remember uh, that <laughs> when you were on shardless agent yeah well i was i was trying something new and you gotta you gotta fail to succeed so hey you got everyone on shardless agent you got matt on shardless i even proved shardless agent and tried mm -hmm. it out I didn't win, but mm. I tried it out. Yeah. So, I mean, what it was is, uh, um, so Shardless Agent starts with, the story of Shardless Agents, for me anyway, starts with Weavers. So, uh, Weavers, for the longest time, had a, a haste problem. So, we were trying to solve that. I went the Shardless Agent route, uh, and Puzzle, at the same time, went the Gretchen route, and we see how that kind of turned out. But it takes, it yeah. takes, it takes conversations happening between players and people, you know, trying to uh, eke out the 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 smallest technical things from whatever commander uh, options they have uh, to try to solve for like Weaver's uh, uh, haste issue, which still exists, by the way. It's just that uh, you know we just kind of deal with it, I guess. So. That's that's probably to explain uh, that that circumstance there is probably to ex explain the Viscopa thing. Plus, uh, I mean, 
just goes to show like uh, the 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 right pilot with the right list at the right time you know with the right matchups so yep and of course uh like you like you indicated for sprite dragon uh no open play because it's not even never been seen never yeah, been it's seen a one for yeah. one deck now to that end like uh where, where the data starts to get interesting is like Abdel uh, in open play. It's got a 62.5% uh, win percentage, uh, but 44.4 in tournament. Now, that's nothing to scoff at, you know? So you could say that Abdel's a deck you could play, right? Yeah, I'm surprised Abdel Sorco Sale has a less percent in tournament because it had a hundred percent in sanctuary were people playing abdel sorko sailor in in the tournament yeah there was in uh, riw there was i want to say there was five no 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 four four abdels uh two feywilds uh one sword coast serpent and i want to say there was an abdel black now of course now now i gotta now I gotta confirm that. Because I just put it out there. I hate being Okay, so you had multiple Abdel Sorco sailors in the last tournament. So that yeah, so that would bring the win percent a little bit down. It's mainly the ones with higher win percentages in tournaments are the ones where there's only one player piloting it. Mm -hmm. As we see with Viscopa, as we see with Abdel and Sanctuary. You just need that that special pilot. Okay, so there was only three, uh, two Feywilds, one Sword Coast Sailor. Okay. Oh, okay. One Sword Coast. Yep. So, and I imagine uh, Feywilds an interesting, interesting choice of a background. And like I'm not even sure. Go blue. Yeah. I'm not even sure if go they. Sword Coast. Yeah. I'm not. Well, to that end, I'm not sure. Uh, once again, I haven't had the opportunity to compare these lists, but. Uh, I'm not sure if they actually, in the selection of Feywild, uh, if they were actually teching with Feywild. You know, we all we know that Sword. If you see an Abdel Sword Coast Sailor list, it's because they they have it as that Plan Z of just attacking with the commander. You know, so why you would choose another background intentionally and not tech with it? You know, so that's that's something to kind of think about too. Is whether or not they augmented the build to tech with Feywild in some some way, you know. So, da, da, da. But still, still an amazing win rate forty four percent, sixty two percent. They're both yeah. really good win rates. Yeah, I mean, right above it, it says uh, top commanders for both. So he he kind of gives the uh, uh, gives the gift right up right up front. So Abdel being the uh, uh, the top listed. Uh, commander uh, suggested for uh, both open play and tournaments. Ah, <clears throat> I'm going to be salacious. And now none of these, none of these lists are ranked. There's no, there's no ranking of like uh, Abdel over Dargo, Dargo over Gretchen, Gretchen over Tatiova, Gut oh, over. Come on, you know. play. We're competitive players. We we rank everything. Everything's so, ranked. But to that to that end, if there were some suggestion of uh, an expression of tier, now I don't know if this would be tier one, tier two, tier three, tier tier you know S tier. I don't I don't know what it would be, but you know, and you know, everyone at this point should know how I I feel about that. But if there was some sort of suggestion that these are the strongest decks. I'm not saying that they're the strongest decks. The statistics are saying, you know, the, the, the players and their results are saying that these are the strongest decks. So, um, needless to say, this is a, a ranked list, which it isn't even ranked, but this is a list that I can stand behind because, uh, it's proven. God is backing it up. The data is backing it up. So, I'm I'm a little taken aback that Dargo Malcolm is on that list. I never expected that, but you know, it, oh, it's win rate is tournament is very similar to its win rate in open play. So it's a 
seems to be quite a consistent deck. <laughs> it might be the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's only one. <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of these decks have only one pilot that was uh, getting all that data to be yeah. to be up there. Yeah. So, uh, Viscopa Guildmage, that, that's all one pilot in the tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, Abdel Sword Coast, so we had another play in the tournament, but all the open play and all of Sanctuary, that was all Gator Bait. It was doing Abdel. Euron Daga Malcolm. Kedis Malcolm, a lot of people are picking that up. Mm -hmm. A lot of and C a lot of C D H Yeah, a lot of C D H players are porting over into uh Kedis Malcolm, so that's a real popular jumping off point yeah. for expats from C D H. Yeah, and you can see that with a only a ten percent win rate in open play, which means a lot of new players trying it maybe changing decks or just you know, not knowing how Pauper works yet, they're using it as a stepping stone into the format, which is okay. That's what that's what the open play is there for. Mm-hmm. Gretchen, we all know Gretchen. That's, that's been doing well. Erinus, it says 0% in open play, but I know it has had a few wins. So I don't know if that's some kind of error in the uh, might be It might be year to date. Ah, so, okay, so Aaronus hasn't been seen recently. Mm -hmm. So, what I find interesting, speaking of uh, matchy matchy, so uh, I hear a lot of uh, personalities in CPDH talk about uh, the lack of Tatiova in tournaments. So, uh, there's a uh, pretty uh, consistent expectation between open play and tournament play with Tatiova, so people should probably pick the deck up. <laughs> yep, I think in in both Sanctuary and in RIW there were zero Tatiova. No one, absolutely no one, wanted to play that. Mm -hmm. so and I had I've heard got better play, I guess. Well, well, I, I heard rumors that uh, there was. Um, so the thing that the re thing that Ryan says all the time has some merit to it, uh, either whether whether or not it's been parroted or or not. But like um, the people that were asked about, uh, you know. If they're playing Simic, you know, well, why this deck and not this deck, you know, that sort of thing. Why not Tatiova? And um, uh, some of the responses that I overheard either by asking myself or listening in conversation was uh, that uh, they didn't want to be a target. You know, so even even without the, the performance, the recent performance data to back it up, uh, Tatiova has, you know, remained uh, kind of a boogeyman, you know, of the format, uh, just based on... Well, I think the the argument that you don't want to be a target could also be based on the fact that the commander is five mana, mm -hmm. which means your opponents have five turns to target you. Mm -hmm. Unlike other Simic commanders, let's say Gretchen, commanders mm -hmm. only two mana, so they mm -hmm. only have two turns to target you. Mm -hmm. So you're still... You're, Gretchen's still the same threat as Tadiova, but it's just less of a threat in terms of the amount of turns people get to target you. Is Teddy over is quite a slow deck. Mm -hmm. It's the same with Abdal. Abdal's also a five cost command. Uh, but Abdal's the one that's been performing well. So mm. Either we need need more Teddy over plays, or maybe that deck is just obsolete now. The, I've got it. It's just too slow. Ooh, ooh obsolete. <laughs> ooh, you're gonna you're gonna enrage the Europeans. <laughs> no, I've got it. I've got it in the box. It's just a matter of. Uh... I don't know. I, I'll i still continue. I go through these phases where, uh, especially in the open play periods, where uh, I'll whip out Tatiova for, you know, a couple, like a half dozen games in a row and attempt to bully, especially especially when I see, um, uh, like, uh, the local chat, you know, in the in, in, in server talking about, uh, you know, not respecting the speed of combo. We haven't had a lot of that here recently, but... Uh, you know, you'll get these uh, whippersnappers that come in and be like, oh, yeah, that, you know, that old thing, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's like, all right, let's let's dust her off and and take her for a spin and I'll play a half dozen games and, you know, I'll probably win two, uh, two of those, two out of six. And, you know, I prove my point and then I put it back, put it back in the box. So, you know, what is the deck that you would take to tournament? Uh, it wouldn't be Tatiova. No. Because I mean, I, 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 okay. Um, I am probably not the best, but one of the better Tatiova pilots. 
uh, that I've seen, you know, of the people I've observed, I am probably in the top five, right? I don't know where I am in the top Considering five. Considering there's five, five players playing Teddy over. <laughs> you, you. I see what you're trying to do there, Clay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm probably one of the, the better Tattoo over pilots. You know, not the best, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty decent. And um, I just, there's, there's been some slow, like I've got it every set, you know, I'm adding tech where there's a uh, tech available. You know, and I'm I'm working on it. I'm probably uh, seven to nine cards different than the uh, the original list. So I'm slowly deviating based on what I'm seeing in the meta. It's it's one of those things that uh, um, I'm gonna want it to have. Like I think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I think I'm gonna want some sort of like early measure of defense. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, like some way to, 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 you know, some stalwart against, you know, the, the, the flood of, of aggro. I'm going to want something now. I mean, yeah, it's got yeah, life gain in the deck, but. I wouldn't call what Teddy over does life gain. And mm. especially because if you compare the five cost commanders, Teddy over and Abdel, mm -hmm. Abdel creates blockers for you. It Correct. Gets, like as soon as it comes in, you're getting like five one ones and that just holds off aggro and Teddy over it comes in. It's just a free, free. It gets bolted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, and you're making uh, you're making some good points about uh, the fragility. You know, Gretchen uh, Gretchen is an anomaly because you can pick off uh, its. I've seen I've seen Gretchen win without a land untapper. So the the typical plans of uh, attacking the weavers, uh, mechan you know, mechanical pieces, the, the, the tattoo of a mechanical pieces, uh, the typical, uh, tried and true method of attacking those avenues for those decks, uh, doesn't work with Gretchen because Gretchen can find a way around that. It's not optimal. I mean, they gotta get a high tide, a, bro a Boro breeze caller, like, you know, they gotta, they gotta jump through some hoops, but, um, I mean, I, maybe, I don't know, maybe the removal's too good, you know? So, yeah, somebody will come over, Teddy over, the value and the combo piece is your commander, mm -hmm. which is the same with Abdel, but Abdel just does it a bit better. So, as Man. we can see by the data, and mm -hmm. also just by um, experience. Man, Jonathan coming Abdel with the... Uh, pretty, pretty strong <laughs> commander. So remember earlier uh, when I said Jonathan comes in with the razor blade? He's cutting this shit up. <laughs> respect. <laughs> Mad respect. I try to be, uh, I'm, uh, if you, if you notice, uh, you know, folks out there in the community, I try to be the most optimistic of the bunch and say, you know, like anything's happened. These other, these other guys come in and go, nope, this, this, you know, fair, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Okay, so uh, anything else out of this list? Uh, there are some uh, uh, comments down below that... Uh, yeah, so the bottom four decks there are the ones that have not seen tournament play, but have uh, been performing really well online. Mm -hmm. And these are mostly lists with only one one pilot. So mm -hmm. Loyal Subordinate, that's been low tad. And I know you've been picking up as well a little bit. Yep. I've Why got have we not seen you play Loyal Subordinate in the recent tournament? Ah, <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, there was no proxies allowed. Uh, yes, I could have switched out the one card, uh, that I, that I needed with something less optimal and played it. Um, it was actually really tempting because, uh, I, I absolutely love the deck. I've played it, uh, several times, uh, now I've got, uh, only one of those is recorded. So I, I don't know. I just, uh, uh, I I know the deck, but I don't know it as well as uh, 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 Malcolm Dargo. So I just stuck with what I know because I think we've also proven, yep. you know, that uh, that carries weight too. So, yeah. Well, ho hopefully we'll get some people picking up loyal subordinate. It is an incredibly strong aggro deck. It is. It's, you it don't is. even need to attack. It just burns people out. Everyone's on the clock. So the sign of a good deck which has, has its win condition in its command set. Mm. 
Now, the last one on the list, Crackling Drake, I'm actually one of the known pilots for myself, Ryan, and Gator uh, are the, the typical pilots for that, uh, that deck. Uh, or the historical pilots for that. Uh, Gator has since taken it apart and moved to something else, but he was on a uh, uh, a Flicker uh, Flicker Drake package that had the looters. Uh, I wasn't playing the looters until I uh, met Gator and then watching him kind of loot. Uh, though, though he would admit that uh, uh, with the shortening of the re- uh, the the game time, the the number of turns. Uh, the looters lose their value because you're not able to loot 11 cards. You're only allowed to loot like five cards. So uh, well, still good value, still good value. And then Ryan probably hasn't touched the deck uh, for like, you know, 18 months now. So uh, he's moved on to uh, bigger, blacker things. So uh, yeah, so Drake, there's some opportunity for Drake. Um, I think it does play. Uh, the control game pretty well. I think it's probably uh, also a good shell for. Uh, I think I can think Gator's list is probably an, an amalgamation between his old list and my current list is probably uh, where it should be at, uh, where you have the opportunity to uh, uh, flicker combo, but also using the flicker combo pieces to regain all of the board control stuff. And then, so it's basically a control deck with a combo finish. I think there's an opportunity um, kind of kind of circling back to that uh, round time. I think that's the thing that's uh, uh, not allowing for Drake. Because, I mean, by the time you power up the Drake and send it, you know, like, you know. Yeah. Well, at least the current versions of Drake um, might be a little bit limited by the round time. Mm-hmm. But we, all we need is a brewer to, you know, yeah. Adjust it to the, the new tournament rules and see how it goes. Yeah. So, yeah, there's notable commanders. Boom, boom, boom. Once again, a limitation of uh, uh, turn data for RAW. So I'm in the TLDR at the moment. TLDR. And then he kind of repeats the notable commanders at the uh, the bottom there. So... Uh, the average turn, once again, with the turns data, uh, the average turns, the 8-7 and 8-3, that's uh, from Sanctuary only, because I don't believe we have uh, um, Riches to Rags. When I know we don't have um, um, R.I.W. Uh, combo, more than 50% of all wins. Now, once again, how much is preference, people preferring to play combo decks for whatever reason? Uh, how much is that skewing? Because uh, obviously, if you have more representation, you have a higher opportunity to win, right? So, I'm not yeah, saying. But then, and yeah. again, if people are preferring to play these decks, then surely the you know the more comfortable decks, the the, the better decks for tournaments. I would say. Well, and 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 to kind of continue that line of thinking, like we haven't the the other shoe hasn't dropped yet. So if if people are preferring combo decks because they're uh, able to win more quickly and all of that stuff, then we have yet to experience the rise or the, the other shoe dropping of the other, you know, part of that equation, the rock, paper, scissors, you know, of the control to stop the combo, the mid range to stop the control. So yeah, combo to stop the mid range. Yep. So yeah, it's just this, uh, this constant evolution and we just haven't uh, turned the corner yet, which I, you know, it'll probably happen this year. Most likely, probably. Right. So, uh, surprise, uh, surprise. You know, it's yeah. an open, open meta. Surprise, surprise. It was, as we said earlier, uh, combo is the most winningest mid range is the least winningness. And there's like 28% spread there. Oof. Yeah, that's, yes. that's, that's tough. But somebody will, somebody will get it. That's a that's a challenge. Some viewer right now is looking at that, going, "Challenge accepted," and we'll see the fruit of their efforts here in about six months. Um, for colors, no surprise, blue is the uh, the the most popular and the most winningest, or has the highest winning yeah winningness. And then I think the most important line, which I did kind of reveal to you guys uh, earlier. Uh, nine words that mean everything. 
So for the naysayers that uh, talk about, well, you don't have enough data points. You don't, you know, the data doesn't mean anything. The data is skewed. It's imperfect. Yada, yada, yada. I hear you. You're also correct, but you're also incorrect. So the goal with this data is to do some predictability, but we're largely predicting. I know we talk about commanders and we talk about, uh, you know, things of that nature, but the real answers that we're looking for when we're talking about player skill, when we're talking about pod composition, this is all anthropological. So the, the purpose of this data is not to look at uh, these decks in isolation, because I mean, who gives a shit if uh, Brainstorm or Ponder is the most efficient card for what it does, blah, blah, blah. That means absolutely nothing in the, in the wrong hands. In, a, in an unskilled pilot's hands, Ponder means jack shit. Jack shit. So what this data is trying to do is it's trying to extrapolate human behavior, you know, and based on historical performance, and we're trying to figure out if uh, all things are samesies moving forward, then we have an expectation that humans being human are going to perform in the same way. And that's how we're trying to get predictability out of the data. Now, of course, it's imperfect. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> and to the argument that um, the data is like not, not good, not a good representation, look, the data has to start somewhere. I'm going to yes. start recording it now. Well, and so the, the point, these nine words right here, the, the point that I'm getting to is that we have riches to rags. And the reason why I feel like this tournament report is probably quintessential. And the problem with uh, it being an hour and 21 into this video is uh, I hope people actually see this part. Uh, the, the, the main thing to focus on is riches to rags had some online players, but not all of them were online players. Right. So you had people, you had wild players out there that attended this, this tournament that uh, contributed to results. Sanctuary was all online players. So I think it was all online players. I, I think I met most of them. So uh, you had a least likelihood of, uh, you know, wild players coming in and affecting the data. And then RIW was mostly wild players and wild concepts and wild, wild ideas. So what I'm speaking to is that you have this unpredictability of these tournaments where anybody can show up with any damn thing that they think is going to win and they're putting up results. And in these nine words right here should, should quiet the naysayers forever because this says the open play data corroborates the tournament data. So the, the same players who are doing all of the grind work and all of that stuff in the online meta, the same 15 people or, you know, whatever people are saying, you know, that are putting this data. Well, I, I tell you what, they're, they're matching the expectation in the wild and the data proves that. So whether or not it's enough or it's skewed or whatever, guess what? It's all skewed in the same direction. So that's, I, I can't, I know I got real passionate there real quick, but I can't, I can't hone in enough how big that point is, is the, the fact that they match and they support each other. So your thoughts. <laughs> um, no, I think, I think we're good to end it off, end it off there. That seems to be a lot of data we've covered. Mm -hmm. One and a half hours of data. Yeah. It's typical. We usually go about uh, 115, 120, right? So uh, any predictability for uh, the next tournament in Sanctuary? Oh, I look for me, I, I really want to attend the tournament, but it's at 3 a.m. in mm. Australia. That, Those and American I would be bastards. playing my Malcolm Brock deck, which has no tournament scenes at the moment, but a mm. pretty good win rate online. Yeah. So. We'll see if I can be bothered to be waking up at 3 a.m. But I'm hopeful. otherwise, I'm hoping to see a lot of Abdel mm -hmm. and a lot of Visco because they are the most recent winners and mm -hmm. see how they those decks pair against each other. That's fair. That's fair. I'm, uh, I'm bringing a deck. I, I just finalized uh, my paper list of TPI today. So 
I'll probably do uh, some TPI grind leading up to the tournament. And um, from what I've heard now, uh, there was no TPI versus Viscopa uh, in the tournament. But listening to um, people talk, I'm basically metagaming with my with my knowledge of uh kind of where the format is at the moment i'm trying to specifically metagame uh the meta at the moment using a known deck so uh, i'm doing a uh, uh it's a nat combo uh it's a combo version of tpi so that's what i'll be grinding and playing and figuring out so if it goes well that's what i'll be playing tpi eh yeah yeah so all right that's that hey if you stuck with us for uh, an hour and 25 minutes good on you uh there's some real bangers in here there's some good info in here and i hope that uh that's helpful to someone and you never know the next uh tournament winner may have uh, watched all hour and a half of this and applied that knowledge hopefully right so any parting words my man uh, no, nothing for me. Righteous. All right, friends. Until the next time, we'll see you on the flip side. See ya.